ran into Perks and Upset getting a cup of coffee backstage with them both discussing what they were going to play today. Perks actually said to Upset, I checked out your OPGG, I see you're playing Yasuo, I'd love to play against it. And Upset went, come on, are you brave enough to run a crit AD into me? And with Yasuo being taken off the table, as well as that Draven, I want to see how the rest of this draft plays out. Karthus and Gragas also find themselves in the ban pool. Uh, what else would you like to see early picked up now that we can see some of these targeted bans removed from the table? Wouldn't mind seeing a Thresh ban coming through from the side of G2. Not only will you take that away from Ignar, but it's also just one of the more contested supports in the current meta. Very strong right now, and you can put a lot of emphasis early on. And you would imagine that with things like Urgot still up and available, uh, if G2 go for the Urgot themselves, Shalka have been known to pick things like the Rise, the Cannon as an answer to it, and it would give Ignar his comfort pick in the form of shit, uh, Thresh. I think the Cannon is uh, an important one for me. Odo Wamnik only undefeated on that champion. Three games played, three wins. He's 12, 7, and 10. And Odo might be comfortable running that into the likes of Urgot if it gets picked up. It's available. It is still 100% picked and banned along with Lucian here in the LEC in spring. But so Jace Instalock after the Lucian ban. Now, Jace is really interesting because he's been rising in prior... Excuse me. In priority? <laughs> Water went down the wrong <laughs> tube and now I can't breathe. <clears throat> right. Jace, much more important on the current meta right now. Uh, and Urgot, uh, it's, while still very strong, many consider Jace to just be so flexible in the draft because not only can he be played in both mid and top, but he's also just very strong into things like the Urgot. Apparently, according to pro players, he doesn't really have any weak matchups. Well, let's see whether or not Wanda can make it work. Uh, obviously, Odo Omne has played that Urgot as well. Unfortunately, he has not won with it. So I want to see how that uh, plays out. Of course, uh, Venice will rejoin us in a moment after he's used the cough button I can breathe, I can breathe, I can breathe. We have the technology, Venice. <laughs> uh, but I like seeing upsets Ezreal. Um, in my mind, uh, the best Ezreal in EU. Uh, definitely extremely consistent. He's played that six times this split already. And he's going to come into the Braum, which will be piloted by Mickey. Ooh, a lot of strong picks have also kind of made their way through the draft as well. You can see both uh, the Cassio and the Zed hovers. Now, the thing about Cassio is she did receive some nerfs on patch 9.3, so teams consider her to be less powerful or uh, lower down on the priority list. But I think that given Abadagi has had so much success on the Lissandra in the past, there's no reason to shy away from it. And now you can kind of start to see these compositions start to build out from the, from both sides. 1-3-1 one, one, very clearly coming out from G2 with strong solo laners in the Jace and the LeBlanc. Meanwhile, Schalke definitely geared more towards the team fighting. Urgot acting as an effective frontline. You have very strong scaling from the side of Ezreal and fairly consistent damage. And also Lissandra just providing a wealth of utility. So do you want to see junglers target banned here or more AD carries obviously on the side of Shelka with them having locked in Ezreal and with Lucian uh, Draven and now Sivir taken off the table Perks may need to dig a little bit deeper he has played the Kaiser in the past if they want to go that bold but you know, what, what direction do these teams want to take the second phase of the draft? I think that Schalke will want to try and limit the AD carry pool for Perks, but I don't think he's too concerned about that, because remember, he has a mid lane pool that he can dip into yep. as well. Uh, meanwhile, for the side of G2, it looks like they're just going to ban away the supports. We already talked about the Thresh earlier on. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw something like Alistair, Tom Kench, uh, trying to think. Pike could be. I think it would be risky for Ignar to go for it, but it is another option in his uh, in his toolkit. Well, we were talking a lot backstage around some of the support interactions, some of the duo interactions. We've seen a fair amount of the Shen over in LCK. Let's see whether or not that's a consideration on what the last pick will be here. It's the Olaf target ban towards Yankos. So with Karthus gone, with Olaf gone, some of the more influential picks he's seen. Last week, I remember uh, uh, Yankos played a fantastic Elise game as well. And let's see what uh, he wants to round out this 1-3-1 one, one with as Jarvan is now taken off the table as well. So the jungle pool has been shrunk. Yeah, and I was just going to say Lee Sin and Nocturne kind of rise in priority right now. Sejuani has been less impactful uh, in the European scene. She just kind of dropped off a little bit after the most recent patch. But right now what G2 are lacking is an engage. Uh, and if they still want that ability to start fights, then they could look for something like the... Uh, Wait a minute. We could be looking at a Jace bot lane right now, quick shot. If that lock, if the Yorick is locked in, it is. All right, oh so we're going to have a, we're gonna have a Jace bot lane, it looks like. 
Okay. Unless he's doing something really crazy and it's the block bot lane and the chase is in mid. Um, but of course, the classic <laughs> Elise. How could we forget about this one? The Yanko special from we the did, old days. We did not forget. We mentioned it. He played it last week. It's picked true. up that win. Very, very true. It has been locked in. I think I also quite like it in a 1-3-1 in terms of the ability to find picks and to play on that side lane. But now, <clears throat> Ignar has to find uh, support that he wants to run into this. This. A fair amount of gauge when you think of the Nocturne Lissandra Urgot that can chase forward. And we will see a pivot, a hover on the Shin, and it is in fact locked in. So Shin support now for Ignor. Um, tell me what G2's comp does and try to predict before the 20 second timer. Well, so it's LeBlanc mid, J-Spot, Yorick top. I'm pretty confident they've drafted themselves very much a 1-3-1 one one comp. They'll put the Jace in the mid lane. They have a lot of poke. Uh, the bot lane we can talk more about once we actually get into the game. It's a pretty novel matchup, one that I haven't really seen very often. Uh, but the the whole goal of G2 is to try and play around their strong laners. Uh, you don't really want to invest a huge amount of ganks into the Yark because at early levels he's not that weak, uh, not that strong rather. <laughs> so I would expect Yankos to invest ganks either into the mid lane or the bot side of the map. Meanwhile, for Schalke, they have a pretty good scaling composition. I like the fact that Nocturne can challenge some of these side lane picks because later on to the game, when G2 tried to split up the map, uh, Memento plus Ignar on the Shen Nocturne duo can very easily turn a 1v1 into a 3 versus 1. And they can punish that very, very effectively. So I quite like the answer here from Schalke. And you can leave Upset by himself because he's playing the Ezreal. He can play fairly safe. So I quite like the scaling on the side of Schalke. And they'll be trying to survive the laning phase against G2. I'm a huge fan of Shen in into comps that are particularly aggressive or teams that have tendencies to fight you and dive you. It's just how powerful that Stand United can be in terms of controlling the pace of the game. So ladies and gentlemen, we are just about to jump into our match of the week as Schalke Nulfia will try to pick up a win against G2 Esports who conceded their very first loss last weekend to Origin. The man on your screen, Perks, will be playing that Jace in the bot lane. Technically, I guess it's a mid laner. Um, doesn't matter for him, though. Before we get to that, though, we're going to head to Draco, who's standing by with Schalke's coach. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, Dylan, of course, G2 continue to throw curveballs in the draft, but beating them in draft was crucial for Origin's success when we saw their first loss. Do you feel like Schalke has gotten the edge today? So we definitely knew from the get-go that Jace was a flex pick and could possibly go AD carry, so that's not too surprising to us. Uh, I think we got a good situation for our mid laner and jungle, which is great, but they do have some, some strong lanes in top and bot, so we'll see. All right, we're going to have to find out how that one unfolds. Back to you guys at the desk. Thank you very much, Dracos, and welcome back to the match of the week. We can already see Caps getting a little bit of trading into Igna. Has a little bit of shenanigans starting around the map. And a very different look team composition here for G2 Esports, not quite what I was expecting. But you know what? I should expect something different because this is a team that likes to surprise us in the draw. Yeah, they certainly do. Uh, J Spot Lane, uh, we've kind of seen littered throughout the years. Most recently, we have seen it a couple times in the bot lane. I believe, I'm almost certain we've seen it in the LPL. We've uh, also seen it at the World Championship a few years ago. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking very of. Well. Yeah, the EDG versus Fnatic quarterfinal, where Deft played it up against Reckless. Yeah, it definitely wasn't as successful as they would have liked. Fun fact, it was running TP back then as well, ahead of the times. Uh, but... Perks on this Jace. You'll notice that he is running the airy. This will help a lot with his poke. Um, and it definitely makes the uh, the pushing matchup that much easier for him. Um, and what you'll notice is that every time Upset and Ignar try to approach the wave, they do outrange the Jace, which means that it shouldn't actually be that easy for Perks to immediately just constantly keep that shove going. Okay, so if we keep our eyes on this matchup, Upset and Ignar playing the slightly more traditional uh, team composition, or duo, we should say. A little bit of a race to level two. Ignar stepping very far forward and will take a couple shots. Of course, that Braun passive will be very, very influential. When I look at the rest of the minimap, obviously Abadage at early levels is pushing into caps. And for the time being, Odo and Wanda trading fairly evenly up in the top lane. So outside of, you know, the, the Yorick is interesting, the Jace is interesting. So there's a lot of like split decision making on where Memento and Yankos 
They need to try and find some advantages for their team. So for Memento, I don't think his early goal is to really try and snowball any lane. Uh, he's going to wait for that level 6 mark, and I think that his goal should be to try and counter gank Yankos. Because the thing about Elise is, very early game focused champion. She's very much about trying to snowball her laners and trying to be ahead of the enemy jungler herself. So the best lanes in order for her to find that early success is in the bot lane and in the mid lane, because you have the Braum setup and you have the LeBlanc setup. And you can already see warding coming out from Shalka to prepare for this. Bot lane ward, there's also the river scuttle that's been secured. Shalka have full knowledge of where Yankos is. Yankos, the ward is just going to expire, so the debris falls underneath his feet. He'll be aware that he's been spotted. Memento was able to get that scuttle crab and back away, but while Memento's on the Sentinel, we'll be able to pick that one up. Actually, he even uses the spell shield to block that volatile spiderling. And that's a decent enough start for Shalka. Good ward, good understanding of where Yankos could be going. And they played with uh, respect, of course, because Yankos was spotted at bottom. Odo feels very comfortable shoving this wave in. And it's something you and I have spoken a fair amount about uh, coming into this week. Vedius was about how pushing lanes and having control in the lanes can, can help you out at different stages. Yeah, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the mid lane matchup in particular, uh, because what you'll notice is that typically when it comes to champions like LeBlanc, they actually have pressure because they have kill pressure. So they'll actually have a lot of ability to just jump on top of your face and try and go for those aggressive trades. Meanwhile, uh, the problem is that at early levels, Lissandra actually has a lot more wave clear, which means that she typically has more push. But we don't have time for that because we've got to look back to top. All right, where's the cocoon? Will connect, disdain gets a little bit of of CC, but there's just not enough damage to get into Odoamne, who had the flash inside that dark procession. So he's able to escape with his life for now. Yeah, so the thing about the top lane, I'm a little surprised the Yankos would actually go for that kind of a play because one of the uh, difficulties of trying to gank Yorick lane is he really doesn't have that much damage in the early game. A lot of his damage is very reliant on the number of ghouls that he has. And those ghouls, the more spawn and they get stronger, the more levels that he has. So by only being level four, he really doesn't offer a lot. Meaning that trying to snowball that in the early game really doesn't offer a huge amount of value. Not right now. And of course, some small CS advantages for nearly everybody on the side of Shalka is to build them up a 600 gold lead. You know, um, obviously there is available gold and experience on the map here for Shalka and Nolfia to, for G2 Esports rather, to pick up. And of course, once Captain Yankos uh, hit level six or rather get the ability to use LeBlanc's level six a little more effectively, that's when Yankos' tower dives and threat in those side lanes become so much more impactful. So we've got to keep our eyes right now on what Memento is up to, because notice again, he's just setting up vision, he's been spending his time farming, wants to try and track where Yankos is and try and mitigate his early snowball. He's already level 5 and has a 10 CS advantage over Yankos, which means that he's doing a good job right now of mitigating any kind of early pressure. Yeah, really good job, and that's so important where Yankos is on this stronger early game jungler yes. as well, with the amount of influence. And it's really important as well, because if we then tie it back into how that works with the mid lane, what you'll notice is that Yanko's already looking for another gank that chains land as well. All right, Caps is going to be able to reach on Abadaga. That's a flash into Cocoon. Self-cast on Abadaga's tomb means there's no further follow-up. And as far as summoner spells are concerned, only Yankos commits the flash. Not done yet. Caps is forced to dash away with a distortion. And I wondered if Abadaga could have got the W down, did not get close enough for this particular engage. And so much credit to Memento. In the Match of the Week video that led up to this, there was discussion around how G2 felt they had to control Memento. They had to use Yankos to do it, and Yankos' early game impact has just not been there yet. But there is a lot of time. The chains interrupt Abadage. He's got no self-cast. And with the help of Perks, just as I'm trying to flame Yankos, he picks up first blood. And Abadage chose to use his E rather than the Flash. He did not expect the Cocoon to come out of nowhere. Uh, I believe he didn't quite have vision of Yankos coming up through the river. And he certainly wasn't expecting Perks to be there as well. So, well, they did, in fact, actually have full vision of it. But he wasn't able to react in time. So I I feel like that not using the flash was a big disrespect play there from the side of Shalka. Oh man, so well played by Yankos. I literally was just about to set that up. Now, underneath this uh, outer turret in the bottom lane, it's a little bit of pressure. Stand United is getting closer for Ignor, but Memento was waiting in the wings. If any sort of skirmishes had broken out, then they absolutely could have gone in for the initiation, but it didn't work out this time around. And Shalka, Nulfir, they still maintain parity as far as gold is concerned. 
but first bled to Perks on his bot lane Jace, and he picked up the Serrated Dirk as well, which is just going to help him out so much. So yeah, uh, here we have Perks uh, just coming out of the bush. They're in full knowledge of where he is. Abadagi chooses to use it. He should just flash at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he doesn't get out of the range of the chains as well. But I like the fact that Perks actually moved up to try and help his jungler there. He recognized that he couldn't do much in the bot side of the map, and trying to push by himself was very dangerous, especially against the Shen lane. Um, so the fact that they're able to find this, and you know, we talk a little bit about Yankos. Uh, his early game impact has been one of the strongest in the league. We talked a little bit about it last week, where he reminded me very much of his old First Blood King days, where even though he's not that involved in as many First Bloods as he is now, as he was back then, he's very involved in a lot of the early game action. He gets a lot of early kills for his team, and even though a lot of the discussion has been around the success of Caps and Perks, Yankos has been the largest facilitator for this team for where all those kills come from. It's absolutely beautiful, and the man that they killed is also a man that has kind of gotten away with a little bit of murder in recent weeks, uh, Vedius. Abadage has some of the highest solo deaths, or highest deaths at 15 in the entire league. He's died 12 times over the last 10 games. This is now 13. Um, it's a significant amount of early game deaths, which is something that can be extremely problematic when teams start to learn that and they can pick on those tendencies. I mean, you say that, and G2 are already attacking that lane, right? He is, a, he is a rookie at the LEC this year, and while he has received a lot of praise for his team fighting, the fact that he has been dying in every single game has kind of gone unnoticed, and right now, again, they're looking to attack. Oh, look at those globals, the paranoia, and Stand United's going to work so well. Defensive flash away, Cap stays alive a few seconds longer. Schalke are unable to commit or confirm the kill. And G2 Esports, they are able to escape with Caps' life unscathed. And the reason we start talking about Abadagi and the early game deaths, at 1.2 average deaths per 15 minutes, it is nearly double the mid lane average, which is 0.56. This time around, Abadagi, with the help of Shaka, wasn't able to put a kill in Caps' pre-15 bucket. And that means that uh, they maintain a small goal lead thanks to the CS. So what we saw there was the power of Nocturne and Shen in their ability to deny some of these early plays that G2 tried to force. The ultimate from Nocturne combined with the ultimate from Shen means that what should have been a numbers advantage for G2 is actually immediately converted into a numbers advantage for Schalke, which means that Caps doesn't get a kill. He's forced to burn both the cleanse and the flash and Abadage gets a little bit more freedom in the laning phase. And what was really impressive was how Caps utilized his passive in that yeah. setup as well. Notice how uh, what happened was he went into his passive when the ultimate dropped. He then cleansed while he was invisible, dashed back to the original point, and the rest of Schalke focused his clone without actually focusing Caps, which means that while he did have to burn his flash because Abadage realized at the last minute, he still got away with his life. So very well played, and you'd expect nothing less from a man of Caps' caliber on a champion like LeBlanc that has that ability to use that uh, passive and, and, and play the mind games. And of course, we focused a lot on the mid and the bot lane because of the early game impact the champions will have. But we've neglected Wonder on his Yorick a little. Um, he's going even in CS with Odo. Odo's picked up the Cull, Merc trades, already 50 CS uh, uh, towards completion. Small gold advantage right now in Odo Omne's back pockets. But I mean, this, this Yorick is really going to fit the ability to play 1-3-1 as well. Can yes. play on the side lane really well, so it fits the theme of the G2 team composition. So the thing about uh, Yorick is in the laning phase, he's typically pretty weak. He gets really strong as a duelist once he gets levels and once he completes the Trinity Force. Now, we might not again have time to talk about that, because Yankos and Caps are looking for some stuff in the mid lane. But again, look at the positioning of Memento. Always around, very wet. I have ulti, I'm prepared to counter gank. And if you're in trouble, I will help you. So don't worry about it, Abadage. You keep doing your thing, and I'll make sure that you're nice and safe. You can see he's even got a CS advantage in this situation as well. So love the way in which Memento is utilizing this Nocturne right now. Rather than be proactive, he's being reactive and trying to read the map. Which helps a lot when you consider the burst damage that can come down from Nocturne and Lissandra, as well as in a few seconds' time, Ignos stands united. Uh, it's currently got about 10% of the cooldown left. And Yankos is still looking, still looking to find a place to impact this map. Um, Yankos waiting in the wings, stood on top of that control ward. And Shaka maintain a small goal lead despite conceding first blood. I still find that very impressive. But one thing we didn't mention just yet was that Perks already has that Ghost Blade completed. 
because he was the one that picked up first. But if you look Very at the true. mini map, it is G2 that's pushing into Schalke's jungle. But the uh, focus right now is Caps. The passive is kill secured. Now all of a sudden, Stand United throwing down some momentum. Defensive flash away from Mickey, and in the melee, in the Stand United, not going to be enough just yet. Mickey stays alive for a few seconds longer. Look at the true shot barrage. Upset is deleting G2 where they stand. Wonder completes a teleport and throws down the maiden, but she simply cannot help. Three for zero to Schalke. Beautiful stuff from Schalke, and it all comes off the back of a fantastic punish from Memento. When we bring the replay up, I just want you to keep your eyes on Caps and what he does in the lane, because he recognizes the situation that Abadage is in. You can still see he has no mana in his uh, bar right now, which means that he can't push the wave. Caps is thinking, okay, I want to try and punish this. I want to take advantage of this and get a quick push in so that I can go back to base sooner. That means that he's going to use both his W and his ultimate on the wave. What does that give the signal to? Memento to engage. No more escape tools. His flash isn't available. All they need to do is land the fear, follow that up with Abadage, and then the chaos ensues from the fight. You have the teleport in from the top lane, you have the teleport in from the Ezreal as well, and while all of G2 get chunked out, Upset can come in from the side and start to clean up. So Schalke very quickly convert uh, what was a small mistake from Caps into three very huge kills. Greedy decision making from Caps ends up turning around. Schalke extended 1500. I, I got so caught up in the action. Ignor got that double Shadow Dash taunt after completing the Stand United. I literally was so excited I frothed at the mouth. I couldn't <laughs> get the words out. Schalke instantaneous reaction and it just it gives you a little bit of hope when you think about this team, this team that many people were calling second best in Europe next to Origin. Origin beat Schalke last weekend, at G2 last weekend, and now Schalke want to try to do the same. Ignor's going to be in a lot of trouble. Paranoia comes down. Ignor stays alive long enough to escape with his life. Here comes Upset. He picks up a kill onto Perks, but it's at the cost of two. That's a double for Caps. Abadag is looking to turn it back around, but it's a three on two. Oh, as Upset that. just gets deleted. The Fangs are sunk in, and he is taken out. Now, Abdaka gets one on the way out, but look at the stun that manages to land from Mickey. Yankos is looking to chase a little bit further. Oh. The cocoon interrupts the claw, and Abadagi goes down. G2 swing right back. And then all of a sudden, G2 find themselves with four kills. This game is turning into a bloodbath before we've even hit the 15-minute mark, and the problem for Schalke is that's not what they want. It was great for them finding those early kills because it could mean it would sn uh, slow down the snowball plan that G2 had for themselves, but now all these kills are being picked up by Caps. Now they're putting themselves in a situation where they can leverage their solo laners. So this starts with Ignar. He knows he has Memento and Upset around, so he thinks he's fine to make this play. Mickey and Perks get over-aggressive here. They shouldn't try for this, uh, and ultimately this was a bad mistake that ends up getting punished. The reason why he gets turned around is because Caps has priority in mid. He makes the faster rotation up, and he actually goes back onto Upset knowing that Yankos is behind him, and they can get the kill. Beautiful use of the LeBlanc mobility to find that. Unfortunately, he can't create a big enough gap away from Abadage to stop the ultimate from coming down, which means that Abadage can pick up some kills, but it's not enough to escape from the duel with Yankos and Mickey. Yankos and Mickey, and you know what, everybody really hitting every single skill shot they needed to. Winter's bite over the wall, near, you know, uh, instantaneous cocoons from Yankos. And in the thick of it, at 15 minutes, we have a bang on even game. Yankos this time round, will be looking to go fishing down the bottom lane. Memento's paranoia. We'll His come up again. in a second or two, but look at the support. Now, Abadag is left mid lane, and we've got Australia lanes. Both duos up top, and Odo is going to try to defend this tower. Paranoia as well as Stand United, meaning Ignor and Memento are diving into the back line. The hourglass is used, but the tower has now fallen. Yankos just gets killed, but it's in trade for Memento's life. Odo's running for his life as he's trying to sustain the safety. Caps is running him down. Abadag is in trouble as Wonders trying to chase him out. Caps looks for the distort, looks for the signal of mouse, gets the chains. Not done yet. There goes the calls, and Wonder sends Abadag packing. Ignore and Apsi were interrupted. I think the Stand United may have been interrupted in fact as Schalke are trying to defend the top tower. And now Schalke are buying into the chaos and they need to sell right now because this is where G2 thrive. Caps is just roaming around the map finding pick after pick. He's completed his first major item in the Luden's Echo and he is punishing every time Schalke go for this skirmish. The actual play itself looked pretty promising for Schalke initially but they got outplayed due to find themselves more kills. And now again, Caps is on the road. Look at this. Caps kills Upset.
And I thought LeBlanc couldn't do that anymore. Well, well no, they can, dude. They 100% well, <laughs> can. That Le LeBlanc with Sork Boots and Luden's Echo, in my opinion, is one of her scariest points in the game. She is so strong because she has two points in her ultimate, and she has so much just raw burst damage that you have to show so much respect. And I love the way in which Caps is just pushing mid and roaming and stopping. Uh, Abadagi just never follows. He never has the ability to. So we have to go back to the first replay. This is where things all kick off. Start off by looking at your minimap. You can see Abadage isn't here. So what they tried to do, Schalke, is try to engage before the tower drops. Now the problem is, for them, is that Jankos immediately re-engages. He uses all of his burst on Memento, who's extremely squishy. So even though he gives up his life, it's at the cost of, hey, I've used everything, so now it's a 2v2. Fun fact, Yorick at level 12 with a Trinity Force and a LeBlanc at level 11 with a Ludens wins pretty much every single 2v2. Oh, cool guys to look at explosions. The ghouls pick up the kill. And crucially, while all that was happening, Mickey did throw down the Glacial Fissure to interrupt Ignor's channel on Stand United, which meant any potential follow-up taunt no, yeah. simply was not going to happen. You can imagine how impactful a two or a three-man taunt could have been in that scenario. It didn't happen, and therefore G2 Esports, two towers to zero, nine kills to six, and 2,000 gold up with an uncontested Rift Herald for now, especially with Perks hitting those shock blasts. Really happy that you noticed that quick shot, because you're right, if Ignar was there, he could have swung that fight heavily in the favor of G2. But regardless, that didn't happen. G2 secured a tower top, they've secured a tower mid, they've secured all the outer towers, and this game looked pretty promising for Schalke. I was really impressed with how Memento was just following Jankos around the map, interrupting every play he tried to make. The fact that they had three kills before the 15-minute mark, all they had to do was slow the game down. But G2, they're a team that never likes to slow down. They keep trying to make plays. They look for constant ganks. And already, even though Caps is sacrificing farm, he's at 5, 2, and 3. He has an 800 gold bounty, and he is the reason why G2 is finding so much success right now. Again and again and again. Uh, Caps, you just cannot discount him. And G2 are just sitting very comfortable. They've got a great situation. Their 1-3-1 one, one has been enabled. Look, LeBlanc was up in the top lane. Wonder on Yorick is down in the bottom. He's going to be on a little bit of pressure. Gets caught. You're not locked inside with me. I'm locked inside with you. Fear beyond death. Picks up the kill, but that is a lot invested for the single kill. What else will G2 be able to secure? Well, they do have the Rift Herald, which means that Schalke won't be able to rotate back fast enough to defend. Uh, but Argy's in trouble as well. Yeah, he's in so much trouble. Flash is available to him, but I think he's going to get taken out before it can work. The Rift Herald manages to get a secondary boop onto the inner turret, uh, inhibitor turret rather. And yes, Schalke used their abilities to get a kill on the bottom lane, but it's at the cost of their mid laner's life, their mid tower, and 50% of the inhib as well. Yeah, that was a big mistake there from Abadage. He got caught out by the chains. He didn't have the flash available to him, and I feel like he has an over-reliance on this E because twice now it has failed him and allowed G2 to extend their advantage. Ooh, take a look at that. Caps looking for upset in the back. Caps actually used his flash to respect the burst damage. Not only did Caps insta-gib him earlier, but now Caps has an Oblivion Orb as well, which he didn't have last time. Nine stacks on his Dark Seal as well. Unbelievable. I mean, Caps is just terrifying. And of course, if, uh, if, if Perks ever lands any poke, then it's just easy for Caps to finish it up. I mean, the last time Perks played uh, against Schalke, his stats were pretty good, in fact. 10% uh, jungle proximity in the early game. He had a CSD advantage over Upset. You can see Perks right now up in 50 CS in this matchup. Admittedly, he's had a couple of ganks and had a couple of plays go his way. And uh, it's, it's been a really interesting game in terms of how things have played out because we saw, we, we kind of saw what we expected from G2, which is Yanko's playing very much more around the mid lane. He had the option of potentially playing around bot lane as well, but instead just focused on the mid lane. And we even saw Perks roam up too to try and help Caps. Um, and I think the whole early game plan for G2 has just been try and get Caps ahead. You know what he can do on highly mechanically intensive champions. And I think that he's demonstrating it once again, that when you put a carry in this man's hands and you actively play around him, you're almost guaranteed success. And this is exactly what G2's comp wanted to do, right? They, they, they have the strengths to take, take the lead, you know, in the one, the two item mark. Um, Shelka, they're down 4,000 gold, but they do have the ability to kill crucial targets when you combo up all the abilities but their window for them to claw back control of this game is shrinking by the second. So it's it's one of those situations where they're 
Their team fighting is still very solid because they can engage with on a Lissandra flank and they have the Nocturne plus Shen combo. Uh, the problem is that if they try to fight right now with the item spikes that G2 is sitting on, they're likely just going to lose. And G2, they're not relenting on the pressure, and they can also very easily split Shalker up across the map if they want to. Well, take a look at that. G2 have already split Shalker in their own jungle. Ignar forced to flash defensively once Mickey threw down the Fisher. Cap steps all the way forward and goes back to the W. Odo fancies himself a shot, trying to get fear beyond death. Here comes Abadage, flash forward, looking for the tomb. Maybe the sub got done to get a chance. Abadage is down. The chain CC sends him through the fountain, and G2 Esports find two quick kills. Odo One is the next target. He's going to get locked down by the cocoon and sent packing as well. Three more kills to G2 Esports, and they're looking at the Nexus. Yeah, G2 might look to try and end the game. 22 and a half minutes in. That loss to Origin looks like it did not dent them at all, as Schalke will likely fall. Oh, absolutely nothing that Schalke can do right now. G2 Esports looking for more kills underneath the fountain. May not be able to pick it up. You know what? It's not even needed. The Nexus goes down, and G2 defeat Schalke. And I feel like we have to go back to that top lane play where G2 all end onto Ignar. It then turned into a crazy brawl. But most importantly, Caps picks up a bunch of kills. He gets two kills. Uh, Yankos grabs himself a kill as well. All of a sudden, the goal is equalized. And the fact that G2 have all this gold in their pocket means that they can just keep forcing plays, keep utilizing their strong solo laners, and they were just super proactive on the map. But unfortunately, Schalke kept buying into every time. These small things that kept going wrong for Schalke, but the gold gap kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You cannot afford any mistakes at all. Not a single mistake. I mean, Memento's early game was so good. Yeah. He was out farming Yankos. He was available for reactive plays at every moment. But unfortunately, two skirmishes at like 14 minutes just felt like it gave Caps the item lead. That was enough to finish the game. I also do feel that Abadage made a couple of crucial mistakes. Uh, sitting on five deaths this game, he got caught out much more than I think he needed to. Uh, and I also think that he could have just he could have been a little bit more loose with his use of the summoner spells, you know? Uh, and not giving over some of those early kills could have changed the pace of the game a lot. Uh, but ultimately, I still think Schalke demonstrated a lot. Last week, they had poor individual performances, their teamwork seemed all over the place, and it was overall very sloppy. Whereas this week, I feel like we saw much more of a return of the, the yes. solid Schalke that we yep. saw uh, for the majority of the first half of the split. Especially Memento for me, because Memento versus Mowgli last weekend was a matchup that Memento himself, uh, along with Amazing on PGL the day before, it talked about how the early impact of whoever's going to fall behind early is going to be really huge for the game, and it was pivotal. Uh, to, to see him step back and coming up against G2 with a strong early game is good. The problem is it is not good enough yep. to take down the number one team in the league. So you guys at home, let us know who your key up player of the game is. You can vote over on Twitter, at LOL Esports. Your three candidates are Caps, Yankos, and Mickey. I mean, it's so difficult because every single one of them was influential at different points. Yep. Uh, Oh, I mean, but it's the Caps, obvious, though. The <laughs> obvious one is going to be Caps. I think uh, maybe I'd, vote, I'd be voting for Yankos because I'm just a fan of Elise. Anyways, you guys at home, if you actually want to watch the best teams here in the LEC fighting for the title, the Spring Split in Rotterdam on the 13th and 14th of April, you can go get your tickets right now at eu.lolesports.com slash Rotterdam. Dracos is standing by with Caps. Let's see what he has to say. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I am joined by Caps. Now, Caps, G2, once again, continuing to pull out interesting picks here in the draft. Yorick showing its face once again in the LAC. You've got Jace in the bottom lane. Talk to me a little bit about what you guys were going for with this composition. Uh, so, I mean, we, we just went for like some of the, the power picks. Uh, we just fought a lot of the champions were really strong. And that's been a lot of Yorick in like NA and EU, but that's performing really well. Uh, I think even in like Korea and stuff. So, so we just went for that. It's, it has a good matchup into the Urgot, and then the rest was just the same kind of thing, you know. And obviously, you guys were stomping there at the end, but there was a moment, uh, kind of in the mid game, where we do see the successful Nocturne ult coming in from Memento, where they're finally able to use the Shen and Lissandra and everything together. Were you at all nervous when you were putting that gold deficit that this might be a game that you don't get to come back from? I mean, they're definitely playing really aggressive, which was uh, impressive. I mean, it was like a bit scary in the beginning because they played really aggressive and they were contesting a lot. And they obviously had each other's back with like the Nocturne and the channel to see that they had practiced it. Um, but because they were playing so aggressive, 
it also shows like a, it's also a weakness, you know. And we knew that one time is all it takes for them to be all aggressive, and then we'll take over the game. And that's kind of what ended up happening. Yeah, we did see that incredible play from you, obviously, on the top side river around that Rift Herald area where you were able to make some of these massive individual outplays. How do you know in those moments that you can go for something that requires you to leap in and out, to like risk dying to this Ezreal? Where do you find that confidence? So I, th I think we found Shen overextending a bit, and then we thought the fight was good. And it started to going a bit like a bit uh, not in our favor, and they were like kind of winning it. But uh, I still had like all my spells up, so it, it was like I was pretty confident in the fight. And uh, obviously we won it. We still had people that were not coming yet. So while it didn't, it looked like they were kind of winning it. We still had a lot of people who hadn't done anything yet. Uh, and once we got those people to start doing things, then then we won it. Yeah, obviously took over the game, kept the pace up, and closed it out. Congrats on your win with Schalke today. Uh, now we're gonna send it back over to the desk with Shocks and the rest of the crew. Thank you very much, Dracos. Uh, yeah, honestly, I thought it would be a more hotly contested game, but in the end, it seemed pretty easy peasy lemon squeezy for G2 <laughs> after maybe a tricky early game. Now, I want to take a look at the picks and bans in the context of what we talked about before the game. Just to summarize, we talked about the two ways that you can attack G2 with, right? You can all or take a scale and composition, choose your moment to fight in the mid or the late game and win the game from there. Or you can go toe to toe with them with strong lane matchups. In this case, I feel like Schalke wanted to scale, but then didn't themselves give themselves the best position to scale. Is that correct? I'm going to say it's a pretty soft yes. I, I do like the fact that they had the Nocturne and the Shen, and just like Caps just said in that interview, it was very clear that Shulk had practiced this maneuver. What I love about Nocturne and Shen as champions that Vedius mentioned on cast is how well they work with teams that are very over-eager, very aggressive, because they can very quickly turn, uh, counter engages back into their favor, which is where a lot of this game started. Yeah, the problem is when you have Nocturne and Shen, and actually they use both ultimates and you don't get a kill from that. That's really painful for a Nocturne. That really needs to get a kill. And then the second try, he actually got the kill on Caps, and that was when he started working better. Uh, still, we didn't see a correct Salke. Like, Salke commit so many mistakes. When they have a composition that they rule, they run around their ultimates. They have to wait for the ultimates, do a play with them, and it has to work. And it happened a couple of times that they used the ultimates and it didn't work at all. It's kind of this idea of, with G2's composition, because it's the likes of the Blanc, the Jace, it's very high tempo. They can quickly move from play to play to play because their cooldowns are so low, whereas Schalke need to make sure that they're on point every single time with these massive long cooldowns. And frankly, Abadaga just wasn't there today. Yeah, Abadaga definitely had, I think, one of his, his worst games we've seen thus far, and that didn't help because Caps, on the other hand, was having a great game. Caps actually had a good game, especially after his draw start. Because after the start, we saw how he got killed by Memento, 1v1 pretty much. And at that point, it should be Salke uh, game. Like, they should control the game completely, but they start playing on uh, D2 uh, playstyle. They start playing, like, long team fights, a lot of team fights, when they're not looking for that. They should look just for Nocturne and send Ultimate to make the play. Well, let's take a look at some of those moments because I think we all felt like, okay, Schalke is in this game. Schalke has tools to work with. But then time again, fights like this transpired. Yeah, I, I have no idea what is, is Ignar doing here. They are supposed to be the one engaging. They are supposed to have Sen ultimate in another side of the map. But instead of this, they are the one getting engaged. And Memento has to run here and just die instantly. Even uh, first it was Perkstein, second it was uh, Mikey X. No, yes. sorry. Um, <laughs> It was Ignar dying, yeah. and then this, this team fight started. And this fight was so bad for Salke because you're giving kills to Caps and you're giving kills to Jankos. And in the moment, two early champions like this get the kills, they kind of start rolling over. And that's the thing. When you look at uh, G2's composition, we talked about how it's so high tempo. It also plays a 1-3-1 one, one so well. When you have a LeBlanc and you have a York, your win condition there, Schalke, is <laughs> do not give Caps any kills. Forget that it's Caps. Don't give LeBlanc any kills. But once she's, what, 5-2 and two after that fight, I believe got a shutdown bonus as well. Yep. Like, there was no stopping Caps. We barely talked about the Yorick, by the way. I know that we talked so much about the possible flexes and, and the depth of the champion pool on both sides. Wonder showing yet another tool they have in their kit. What do, kit, what do we make of it overall? I mean, Jace was one of the picks that they had flexed between the mid and the top lane, but now G2, again, they throw out the, the trump card. Now oh, it flexes it's down not. into the bottom lane. <laughs> yeah. So they're still doing the same old, same old G2 thing where they use flex picks as a priority pick so they can sculpt a winning matchup somewhere on the map. And for this instance, it was hiding 
getting that York pick for that strong side lane pressure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think uh, we talk a lot about how Shell could drop the ball, but we also need to look at how G2 played this out. Uh, how much of this was G2 playing out their game plan? I mean, Yorick is supposed to be a counter to Urgot. Yorick is supposed to be a champion that in the moment it starts scaling, uh, Urgot can do anything on lane. So you actually have a counter pick there. You're actually dropping Jace into bot lane, as, he, uh, as, as we said, that it's not the best in bot lane, but since Perks can play almost every single champion, he make it work. But still, once again, the composition of the two wasn't the best. It relies so much on individual skills and G2 Bane on point. I mean, I don't want to say that this is Schalke's game to lose, but it felt like Schalke made the conscious decision to fight G2 where G2 like to fight. They love these scrappy skirmishes. Arna, you said it backstage, you know, why are you fighting G2? This is what they love to do. If Schalke had just stayed away from them, waited for their longer cooldowns, they had counters to playing side lane like the Orc because they had Nocturne and Shin. They could have played a swing composition. Well, I'd love to hear or talk to some of the Schalke members after this because maybe they will say, well, yeah, this was not what we meant to do, but we got sucked in to how G2 likes to play. I heard you uttering uh, on the desk when we were watching the game, how come G2 is winning this game? This is ridiculous. And I have to say again, one of the reasons is that man in the mid lane. The, the thing was, the man in the mid lane was the only one who was equal on farm uh, in his opposite side. The rest were losing. And this is one of the plays that just ripped completely Salke because they are planning to do a 4v3 on bot lane, but Sen got stopped by the Braum ultimate. So in the moment Sen doesn't appear there, it's actually a 3v3 and they have better kit to kill everyone for D2. Because again, I love the game plan from Schalke. If Shin's ult comes in right there, that's they perfect. Win. And yes. you have to think that that was what was happening at comps. I'm going to ult, it's going to be fine. So they had the confidence to do it, but because they didn't get that Shen ultimate, everything went sideways. So this was a problem of execution. It was, and Caps picked up all the kills, also picked up Kia, player of the game for this one, with 65% of the Shocker. votes. It might as well be just KDA. <laughs> there he goes. He shows up again in the mid lane for G2 Esports, and G2 walk away with the win over Schalke. Now, as we continue, last week, Rogue, they secured their first win of the LEC Spring Split with a massive performance against Misfits. Will we see more of this tonight when they face off against XL? Find out when we return.